morning and welcome to the CABE webinar Wednesday. Today we're looking at the Building Inspector Registration with CABE Technical Director Richard Harrell. With the introduction of the Building Safety Regulator, all building inspectors will need to register with a regulatory body. This presentation is set to discuss the significance of registration for building inspectors, the various procedural options and the requirements needed to become certified to inspect buildings. My name is Shanika and I'm the Training Learning Administrator here at CAVE and I'll be acting as moderator for this morning session. We strive to create interactive webinars and we do encourage you to submit any questions you may have during the session. These questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We will get through as many as possible, but if we do run out of time, I will collect any questions and send out the answers in due course. You can also email webinars at cbuilde.com. If you're watching us live, you can use the side panel to send in your questions and alternatively, you can get in touch with us via the social links now on screen. Let me introduce today's webinar speaker, Richard Harrell, CAVE's Technical Director. He has trained and worked as an architect in both public and private sector practice and as a policy official in the Building Regulations Division of MHCLG between 2007 and 2014 where he oversaw introduction of policies on accessible housing, security standards, broadband, and the national space standard for new homes. He was subsequently head of technical policy in the period 2014 to 2017. He's currently sitting on the CIC competence steering group and is involved in a number of competence working groups, as well as chairing the British Standards Institute Committee on Competence in the Built Environment. He is technical author for FLEX 8670, the recently published British standard on core criteria for building safety in the built environment. So if you give me a couple of seconds, I will just hand over to Richard and he will begin shortly. So I'll stop sharing, Richard, and you can start. Thank you, Shanika. Absolutely brilliant. Welcome, everybody. Very good to see you. I'll just start sharing my screen and uh, we can begin. Excellent. So... Um, Welcome to this presentation. Today, I'm going to provide a bit of context. I'm going to talk about competence in general, about building control regulation, and then the CAVE Building Inspector Competence Assessment Scheme. Uh, so um, first of all, we're going to look at why we need to change. Just a reminder of the drivers for this and why this is so necessary and so important. We're going to look at the building safety regulator and competence, um, because for building control, there are two sides to the competence coin. One, one is the requirements placed on building control bodies and building control inspectors to be competent. The second is uh, the way that competence is going to be enforced and the con broader context for competence. I'm going to run across the uh, framework for registration of building control as a whole and the implications of that so that everyone is aware of um, the changes that are coming forward. And I'm then going to talk about building inspector registration and talk through uh, the Cape Building Inspector Competence Assessment Scheme that was recently approved by the Building Safety Regulator. So let's start with the, with the why. Um, I think this quote from Dame Judith Hackett um, is very good at explaining the kind of primary components of the problem that we face. Uh, what is initially designed is not what is being built and the quality assurance and materials and people are seriously lacking. Now, design isn't the only problem in terms of um, uh, sorry, construction isn't the only problem in terms of uh, compliance, but we've got a we've got a big compliance problem with within our industry. We have a quality assurance issues with materials, and the Morel Day report that was published a month or so ago sets out a whole range of further steps that might need to be taken to ensure that our materials and construction products um, are performing in the way that we want them to. But the competence issue really faces up to this last part, which is the quality assurance of people is seriously lacking. So we have an industry that has not managed competence of its workforce in the way that is needed to deliver the right outcomes. And the repercussions of that are, are all too clear. And um, the catastrophic failures at Grenfell Tower um, are the pinnacle event, if you like, of uh, a whole range of industry failures uh, ac across the regulatory sector, across the industry sector, across the manufacturing sector as a whole. But they're endemic um, or um, just a good example of much wider spread problems with quality management, the Edinburgh schools problems that are very 
uh, widely understood were a red flag that the industry couldn't undertake uh, even kind of lower risk or more uh, basic building work to the required standards on a consistent basis. Um, and as we've looked into uh, the problems with fire safety um, across the UK, what we've found uh, are serious quality control issues across a whole range of issues that reach beyond um, the immediate fire safety issues into much more detailed quality control processes. Now, the reason for mentioning this is clearly that um, it's driven a whole range of changes, um, not least in oversight of the building control sector, but these changes are, are needed. There can be no doubt about that. And I think that we all have to embrace the change that's coming towards us. Uh, I think I'm amongst a, uh, a very uh, significant um, majority of people who view this as a very positive process of change that's gonna strengthen uh, compliance, it's gonna improve safety, it's gonna improve um, the performance of building control bodies and it's going to improve the working life of building uh, inspectors. Um, but let's talk first about the broader regulatory environment. So the building safety regulator um, and competence. Um, the building safety regulator's powers stem from the Building Safety Act 2022. Uh, and the two sections of the act that are most relevant are part two, which sets out the regulator and its functions. Um, and part three, which modifies the Building Act 1984 and includes uh, much of the detail about um, building control approvers and regulators of the building control industry, local authorities included, and the registration of, of building inspectors. The building safety regulator has five key duties, um, a duty to facilitate safety in high risk buildings, a duty to keep safety and standards of buildings under review, a duty to establish systems for giving of building safety information. And the fourth duty is a duty to facilitate improvement in the competence of industry and building inspectors. The fifth uh, duty, proposals and consultation on regulations, also means that there's an ongoing process of continuous improvement. But when we look at the main drivers for, for the building safety regulators' activities, uh, competence is one of three primary areas where we're going to see um, an absolutely enormous sea change in expectations. The regulator's duties uh, mean that they must provide assistance and encouragement to industry and building inspectors to improve competence, establish um, a committee on industry competence, undertake research analysis, workshops and engagement on issues of competence and improve the competence of registered building inspectors. To support it in that work, um, it has three industry committees, the Building Advisory Committee, the Residence Panel, and this third committee, the Committee on Industry Competence, or the Industry Competence Committee, as it's now known. Um, recruitment's recently happened to the Industry Competence Committee. Uh, it's had a precursor called the Interim Industry Competence Committee, which has been helping to set up and establish what work uh, this committee should undertake. But its primary functions revolve around monitoring industry competence, advising the regulator on industry competence, advising persons in the built environment industry in relation to industry competence. So that's about setting expectations, facilitating persons in the built environment industry to improve, providing guidance to the public on how to assess competence of people working in the built environment um, and undertaking research and analysis to support these functions. What, what's key to take away from this is an understanding that this is the start of a long-term journey for the industry as a whole to uh, address, manage, and then continuously improve the competence of the people and the organizations that work within the built environment. Um, overseeing this, we have the building safety regulator with the industry competence committee as their primary um, function focusing on competence. Um, but it's worth thinking about the change in expectations that we should have as to how the building safety regulator is going to operate we're likely to see much increased expectations around enforcement because the BSR sees enforcement as a vital and normal part of everyday functions. And that ranges through from informal enforcement up to uh, prosecution. They'll be setting very clear expectations around individual responsibility. They'll be using joined up intelligence across all of the BSR's functions to direct their energies and to focus on areas of risk. Uh, and they will continue to hold the industry at risk um, throughout this process. The, the BSR and the HSE will not be 
um, in a position where they uh, take responsibility for what the industry has done. The, the, a culture of um, getting sign off from a higher authority, and this includes building control bodies, um, will no longer be permissible. So we'll see a lot more information um, and we will see investigations as well. The BSR um, has extensive investigatory powers um, and the ability to charge uh, on a cost recovery basis for that work. In terms of regulating building control bodies, I think we'll see a similar uh, upswing in proactivity and engagement. So there'll be much tighter operational requirements over time. Uh, there'll be um, continuing audit of building control bodies, uh, but it's, that will be extended across local authorities as well as the work that SICA has done for approved inspectors. And I think there'll be an expectation um, that building control bodies will be expected to act as more assertive regulators. So there's going to be a rebalancing that happens in terms of the client uh, building control body relationship that's predominated over recent decades. Um, and as a regulator in high risk buildings, we'll see um, risk based principles um, integrated with uh, compliance based approaches uh, and a focus on ensuring outcomes rather than compliance with um, prescriptive statutory standards or expectations. Um, the main driver in competence terms to achieve this is going to be um, the duty holding regulations um, that are being brought into force. These set specific requirements for key duty holders, who I'll talk about in a moment. But for most of the industry, whether they're designers or contractors, um, uh, clients or other uh, specified duty holding roles, there are a whole series of general duties, which, which pretty much set out the core driver behind these duty holding regulations. And these are relevant to all building work. So it's absolutely critical that everyone understands that these requirements, these expectations are relevant to all building work. So if it's, if it's covered by the Building Act and the building regulations, then it's covered by these expectations. And these expectations are actually going to be written into the building regulations um, and are already written into the Building Safety Act, um, which amends the Building Act itself. So what are those key duties? Everyone will have a duty to cooperate and share information, Everyone has a, a duty to plan, manage, and monitor work to ensure it complies with building regulations. Everyone needs to um, comply with any other specific requirements, particularly in relation to uh, high-risk buildings. Everyone needs to ensure that they and the people they appoint are competent, which means um, having the right capability in terms of organizations and the right skills, knowledge, experience, and behaviors to carry out work that they're engaged in. Uh, and everyone is expected to ensure that they only undertake the work within their limits of competence. The duty holders that are coming into force are um, pretty familiar to us. They're drawn from the duty holding regime in the CDM regulations. Um, the one difference is the accountable person role, which only applies for high risk buildings, but it's a really important change. Um, the accountable person is a named individual in the person who owns the building, who is responsible for the building's safety, full stop. Can't be delegated responsibilities. That person, if something goes wrong, is the person who will be held responsible alongside the organisation. But the other roles are quite familiar. We've got the client, who's the person commissioning the work, principal desire, designer who's in the overall um, charge of the um, design phase of the work, the principal contractor in charge of the overall construction phase of the work. Designers are pretty much anyone who undertakes design work or prepares or modifies a design in the course of their work. And contractors are effectively any, any person as in individual or organization that undertakes building work in the course of their work. The key difference from CDM is that these requirements are not to do with the process of building, the health and safety management of that process, they are focused on delivering compliant outcomes in relation to the building regulations. Uh, and those outcomes are focused on the functional requirements and functional outcomes, not the specific prescriptive requirements that are set out in the approved, either prescriptive requirements in the approved uh, documents or statutory guidance. So very much about fo um, functional and outcome-based um, objective setting. And that's backed up with a whole range of new and strengthened 
uh, sanctions and enforcement powers. These are just some of the key powers I wanted to highlight. So um, compliance notices have been made easier to issue. Stop notices have been introduced for various types of work. Um, and they have the capability to be very disruptive to construction projects, but they, they give an extra uh, tool in the armory of enforcers. Um, there are a series of measures to ensure that people can't evade accountability. I've put two here. The liability of officers of body corporate means that in certain circumstances where there's um, failure to comply, um, the people who work for an organization can be prosecuted if that organization has been found to be guilty of non-compliance. So, uh, and those that's on the grounds of consenting, conniving, or acting in a neg negligent way that contributes to the, to the non-compliance and, and the problems that have arisen. Um, and there are building liability orders, which enable courts to track back um, through various mechanisms to um, parent or sister organizations, even if a company has gone into receivership or is no longer operating, um, it enables courts to track back and hold people accountable over the longer term. Uh, there are also significantly strengthened powers. So uh, section 35, breach of the building regulations, um, the time period for enforcement has been made unlimited. So there's no point uh, at, at which um, the power to enforce comes to an end. So once building work is uh, has been uh, undertaken, if something comes to light, there is no time limit for taking action. Section 36, notice requiring rectifications, timescales being extended from one year to 10 years. Uh, section 36, the Defective Premises Act, um, it's now 30 years retrospected from 28th April 2022 and 15 years going forward. So that's gone from six years to 15 years in terms of exposure to any claims under the Defective Premises Act. And there are proposals for Section 38 civil sanctions, which allow individuals who are not connected with the original building work to take action to recover um, losses arising from injury or damages from non-compliance or in certain prescribed certain circumstances. And that has a 15 years time limit. So the time limits are, are much, much longer. Critically, um, it is expected the building control bodies will take enforcement on matters of competence. And the way that we understand uh, this is likely to be implemented is through what's known as a track back approach. This is uh, an approach that would be very familiar to people who've worked with the HSE. Uh, the main difference is that whereas traditionally uh, building control bodies have focused on achieving compliance of the building work um, and will normally, once they're satisfied that that's been achieved, will um, move on. Um, the expectation here is that once um, a non-compliance is identified and rectified, the building control body will um, seek to identify why that happened uh, and it will approach the principal contractor principal designer or client whoever is the most appropriate um, duty holder and seek answers to questions around who made the decisions how people's competence was managed how people were judged to have the right skills and attributes to deliver compliance and how that work was man managed and reviewed uh, this is going to be an interesting area for enforcement, but it's critical to understand that these building regulations relating to competence are intended to be enforced in a similar way. So industry is going to need to change. Um, if you're talking to people working outside of the building control world, these are the kind of areas they need to focus on. They need to look at competence, having a competence management system, measuring the competence of their staff, whether that's through professional memberships or training or accreditation managing that competence, putting systems in place so they can evidence that they're fulfilling those policies. Everyone needs to review their process and records, given the changes in timescales. Everyone needs to look at how they communicate and collaborate. They need to actually review their working procedures so they can demonstrate that they are working in the positive way required by their duty holding general duties. And everyone needs to refocus on technical and procedural compliance with the building regulations primarily with a focus on the functional outcomes rather than statutory guidance. So if you look at the wider landscape, what we can see is that improving competence of organizations and individuals will be 
um, transformational. It's going to have a massive impact on the way the industry works. Everyone's going to have to work through that process. Everyone's going to have to start looking at moving to higher standards and having better evidence of how they're competent to work and how they organize and manage their work. And in that respect, building inspectors are competence pioneers as the first fully functionally regulated profession in the industry. And that's on both an individual and an organizational level. Everyone else is going to need to follow a similar path. They might not be under the direct regulation of the building safety regulator, but ultimately um, the industry as a whole is going to have to change its work practices. So building control is going first, but the expectations reach across the sector as a whole. If we move on to registration of building control, there are a whole um, range of different aspects of the regulatory framework to understand. Uh, and I'm going to work through those um, in the orders shown on the screen at the moment. So if we look at the key changes, approved inspectors will need to re-register as registered building control approvers. Um, and the registration period is 1st of October to, to April next year. The building safety regulator will directly oversee the registration of building control bodies. So SICA will cease to function um, as we understand it from the 1st of April next year when the RBCA registration period comes to an end and the BSR will take over those functions. The building safety regulators set criteria for building control, um, registered building control approval registration. Local authorities don't need to register because they are statutory services and the building safety regulator knows who and where they are. Um, all individual building inspectors will need to be registered. Local authorities and the building safety regulator acting in high risk buildings will be known as building control authorities. So we've got two name, two name changes, registered building control approval and building control authorities. And the registration periods for building control approvers will be five years as per the current SICA audit regime, but for building inspectors, uh, it'll be four years uh, for revalidation. And this is one of the biggest changes is that building inspectors will be expected to go through a reassessment of their competence once every four years. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that later. Uh, Critically, registered building control approvers and building control authorities must obtain and consider the advice of a registered building inspector before carrying out certain building control functions and activities. And this is the, if you like, the skeleton of the drivers for um, the registration of bodies and individuals. Restricted activities and functions can be broken down um, into two kind of generic sets of descriptions. Restricted activities are primarily um, those activities directly related to de determining uh, compliance. Um, and as we understand it, that's plan checking and inspection work. Restricted functions are tied to um, the procedural decision making or uh, transactional uh, stages of the building control process. So issuing of certificates, making of decisions. Um, uh, and building control um, bodies will need to look very carefully when these regulations are published um, to ensure that their procedures utilize a registered building inspector at the critical sign off points listed under functions. So activities are quite broad based as we understand them, but functions are going to be very much more specific. Looking at the overall framework for building control regulation, uh, there have been lots of consultations, lots of documents, uh, but you can basically break down the key documents into the following blocks. If you're looking um, at, um, the, from the viewpoint of a registered building inspector, the two documents you will most want to focus on are the uh, Building Inspector Code of Conduct and the Building Inspector Competence Framework, or BICOF. If you're a registered building control approver, you'll need to look at what are known as professional conduct rules um, and operational standard rules. As a local authority, you'll look at your local authority code of conduct instead of the professional conduct rules, but you'll also need to look at the operational standard rules, which are precisely the same as for um, building control approvers. And if you're working within the building safety regulator, you'll be working within the regulator's code instead of the local authority code of conduct or the professional conduct rules and uh, have oversight rules and conditions set by um, the sponsoring government department. 
If we look at these in more detail, professional conduct rules um, only apply to registered building control approvers because local authorities are bound by their local authority code of conduct. It's a principle-based system. They're not meant to be exhaustive rules. They, you, you know, building control approvers have got to apply professional judgment in everything they do. Uh, one of the key elements that's highlighted throughout um, the BSR's recent engagement um, and text is uh, around ensuring that building control approvers do not give design advice or act as a principal designer in their capacity as a building control approver. That's something that we'll follow up on in subsequent uh, webinars. Um, and where these rules are breached, they can result in disciplinary action, including um, cancellation of registration if the offence is um, uh, serious enough. The principles are pretty um, uh, simple to understand. So act with honesty, act with integrity, maintain professional competence, deliver services with professional skill and care, uphold public trust and competent confidence, treat everyone fairly and comply with legal obligations. So those are the principle based standards against which um, any judgment um, will be made if there are concerns. And then there's supporting information um, in the standards within the professional conduct rules, uh, which set out far more detail about what those expectations are. Standard one, comply with legal, regulatory and professional obligations. Standard two, business requirements, so how you operate your business as a building control approver. Standard three, professional competence and continuing professional development, so how you manage the competence of your staff. Standard four, standard of service. Standard five, engaging with clients. Um, and then an annex which sets out obligations to cooperate with the regulatory authorities. All building control bodies will have to comply with operational standard rules, which set out the framework for the way that building control bodies run. And just as with all, all the other documentation that's been produced, these are pragmatic, sensible, common sense requirements. Um, there are links to the documents at the end of this section. Uh, take some time to review them. Uh, they're well worth um, a read. And I think actually, uh, for anyone who's worked within the sick care regime, these requirements will be largely familiar. Um, they're set out in uh, four kind of key areas, systems and controls. So how do you plan using risk-based approaches? How do you use systems to control um, your fulfillment of statutory consultation requirements? How do you keep your policies and procedures um, to manage the competence of persons delivering your building control functions recorded, et cetera, et cetera? Um, second section looks at persons involved in building control functions, and this is all about good practice in managing, maintaining, and developing the competence of your people and allocating the right people to tasks. Uh, a section uh, the following section is on building control functions, sets out expectations to deliver functions effectively and efficiently, work in partnership with other um, relevant bodies, communicate information um, relating to certificates in writing, complying with requirements for statutory consultees, producing and retaining reports of inspections, etc. So how you actually put in place the recording, knowledge management, procedural side of your business, and then enforcement and invention. Um, intervention expectations around how um, building control approvers should um, seek to drive compliance to higher levels. That's then supported by a series of monitoring arrangements, um, which are underpinned by a series of key performance indicators. Again, um, these are sensible data return requirements. Um, there's nothing here that should seem strange. Um, and they will enable the building safety regulator to act um, on robust intelligence and evidence to um, undertake market interventions if they're necessary to drive the outcomes they want. So again, first KPI is around building control functions. The second is around enforcement and contraventions. The third is around risk management. The fourth is on competence. The fifth is on systems and control. And the sixth on complaints handling and appeals. There are transitional arrangements that have been published. I'm not going to go into these in, in detail, uh, but effectively building control approvers have got between 1st of October and April 2024 to register. Um, if they do register and they remain the same, same legal entity, there are some conditions here, but um, if they remain the same legal activity uh, entity, then um, their existing work will simply transfer across. If they don't become 
a registered building control approver, then there's a transitional period whereby they either need to complete work or hand it over to another building control body, um, which could be a building control approver or revert it to a local authority. And there are arrangements for in-flight high-risk building work, which enable registered building control approvers to um, maintain control of work um, if it's started um, in line with new definitions of commencement and within a certain time period. Um, these are all consultation measures as far as I'm aware at the moment, so they do remain to be confirmed, but they allow a pretty pragmatic transfer of function. The way that those functions are controlled will be through cancellation of initial notices um, um, or the inability to um, make new initial notices for high risk buildings. Um, but there's also plans to introduce new powers to um, cancel initial notices if a building control approver or a building control body is um, sanctioned. Um, there are new requirements uh, in relation to plan certificates, which need to be mandatory for any building work subject to the regulatory reform fire order. Um, and there are new uh, measures in relation to initial notices that enable the transfer of transfer responsibility for inspecting work from one uh, building control approver to another um, and the procedures that need to be followed for that. Again, these are still subject to consultation as far as I'm aware. Um, Finally, in terms of the overall framework, there are new powers proposed in terms of information gathering under Section 52 of the Building Safety Act. So these are measures that require building control approvers to share information where they are reverting building work to a local authority, um, primarily arising out of the default of some building control bodies a couple of years ago, where it was found that the ability to recover sufficient information to take control of the work was inadequate. Uh, and then there are further amendments to the approved inspector regulations, um, which require additional information uh, to be captured on who is actually undertaking the building work. So further detail on the builders, primarily contractors carrying out the building work and requirements to consult the fire and rescue service and sewerage undertakers within a prescribed time period. So let's move on to registration of building control professionals. Uh, we're going to talk about the building inspector code of conduct restricted activities and functions and classes of registration so um code of conduct uh, very similar you know everyone who's going to get registered will need to be familiar with this code of conduct plus any other codes of conduct which they they are subject now um ideally there would be one code of conduct that was used by all professional bodies and used by all regulators it's not the case at the moment but again, if you read the code of conduct that's been published by the building safety regulator, it's very understandable. It covers the same areas that are covered by the CABE code of conduct, um, and it should be very familiar. There shouldn't be too much uh, difference uh, between uh, complying with one and the other. Um, the key areas covered are honesty and integrity, professionalism, competence, respect, um, and for sustainability and protection of the environment, dispute resolution and cooperation, in general, the one area um, that does differ between the CABE code of conduct and the building safety regulators code of conduct is that the CABE code of conduct is um, focused only on those activities undertaken in relation to professional membership. But the building inspector code of conduct seems to um, look at any behaviours, including those beyond your professional role that could bring the profession into disrepute. So that's worthy of note. Uh, we've talked about restricted activities and functions um previously but again activities planning plan checking and inspection restricted functions um primarily related to transactional elements the building regulations um and registration is going to have four classes so class one it's referred to as trainee but but it, it, it effectively covers anyone who either doesn't or hasn't quite got to the stage where they are ready to register um, as a class two building inspector. So the class two registered building inspectors will cover the most common types of building work, primarily um, simpler or non or, or standard, very standard types of building work up to 18 meters. Um, class three covers high risk buildings uh, and or non-standard buildings. Uh, so these are um, building inspectors with higher uh, technical capabilities and experience of working with more complex or higher risk building control situations and class four technical manager. So this is uh, for people who are overseeing technical teams in effect 
if you're not managing technical teams, you don't need to register as a technical manager as we understand it. Um, uh, primarily um, requires a similar skill set to class two or class three, if those are the teams you're managing, uh, but much, but also requires higher levels of health and safety and management competence. Um, the Building Safety Regulators Building Inspector Competence Framework sets out, I think, nine key um, competence subject areas that it covers in terms of topics. So law, technology, building services, functions and activities, plan assessment and enforcement, inspection and enforcement, management and core skills, safety management and ethics. So these are the kind of key areas of competence that the BICOF requires are measured. And it, it sets out requirements against each of the competencies in each of those areas at four levels. Um, level A is awareness, so a basic knowledge of the subject area. Level B is appreciation, a general background knowledge combined with an appreciation of intent. Level C is understanding, sufficient knowledge of competence involved to make independent decisions and assessments regarding compliance of building work. And level D is comprehensive, sufficiently and detailed knowledge and skills to make decisions on complex issues. Now, you don't need to memorize all of this. Um, and when we talk about the CABE scheme, you'll see that we have translated all these into a single frame, sing, uh, into a single framework that um, incorporates the core elements of the BICOF. Um, the way that each of those topic areas is expressed is in two parts. If you if you read the um, Building Safety Regulators BICOF, this is the way that it's structured. Um, there are overall competence statements for each of the topics, and those are set out, those expectations are set out at each level. So if you look at the section on the screen on the left, um, you have level one, competence overview, level two, level three, level four, and those are cumulative. So you add these up as you go up each level. So level three incorporates the competencies set out at level two and level one. Again, we've we've assimilated all of this information into the K Bikoff our version of the building inspector competence framework so you don't need to go through that process of trying to um, add those together and each of the topics is then supported by um in examples of uh, competence criteria which are effectively indicative examples of evidence that can be used to support um competence assessment against um the actual uh, overall competence statement on each topic Again, we've assimilated these into the CABE Building Inspector Competence Framework, but if you want to reference back to the BICOF, that's where you'll find the, the core information. And this is all brought together into um, a matrix. Down the left, you have the different classes of registration. Across the top, you have the competence areas. And then in each of the grid squares, you have the level of competence from awareness up to comprehensive understanding that's needed against that um, competence, that topic um, for that class of registration. The one thing to note, so these vary um, across all the different classes, but the one thing to note is that all building inspectors are, are required to have comprehensive um, understanding of the ethics um, of the work that they do and the implications of that work. So there are links in the presentation which will be circulated um, to all of those key documents if you wish to look at them. So let's move on to uh, the CAVE Building Inspector Competence Framework. So I hope what I've given you so far provides a context. It provides the um, fundamental regulatory framework within which building inspectors are going to be registered. Um, and now we can talk about how CABE um, is going to bring forward a scheme to support the registration of individuals. So we're not dealing with building control approval bodies. What we're dealing with is the registration process for individuals. So um, on the 17th of July, very pleased that the Building Safety Regulator was able to announce that CABE had um, been approved to provide a scheme for registration. Um, that approval is subject to um, quite detailed criteria for scheme approval. And we've been through a process of evaluating how we will meet those criteria, which include provide a commitment. So we are legally committed to sign terms and conditions with the building safety regulator for how we will deliver this scheme. Um, how we incorporate the building inspector competence framework and evidence that we are able to keep that up to date as it changes and develops over time. 
how we provide expert assurance within the evaluation of our framework approach and within the assessment processes itself, how we will manage all the various different aspects um, of the system being delivered, including um, ensuring oversight and consistency, and uh, how we assure independence and impartiality um, within our system so that we're not acting within our own interests or under the influence of, of other parties. Key to all of that is third party oversight by the Engineering Council. Um, we are in the process of progressing our detailed final approvals with Engineering Council now that the scheme um, criteria have been clarified. But they provide a vital check um, over both the process and standards that we set uh, and also linked together to um, our license review more broadly. So we have that third party oversight, which is so important in maintaining standards in the long term. Looking at timelines, well, things have moved quite rapidly this year. So the final version of the BICOF, the Building Safety Regulators, Building Inspector Competence Framework was published in April. Uh, we had a BSR conference shortly before that in March, where CABE um, talked for the first time, I think, about the um, scheme that we've been looking to develop. Criterion for approval of schemes was issued in June, and we were improved as um, a scheme provider alongside the Building Safety Competence Foundation in July. Um, where are we going next? So hopefully we're going to be able to publish draft documents, which I'll talk about in a moment later this month, probably around the middle of the month, but that's subject to um, getting uh, final details um, agreed with uh, Engineering Council. We hope to open the stage one application. I'll talk about the application process shortly. The CAVE members for class two, three and four registration in September will be um, completing our panel assessor selection and training in September. So uh, we've, if you haven't seen it, we've, we've issued an appeal for experienced building control inspectors who are CAVE members at CBUILD-E um, or FCABE to put themselves forward to help us in terms of panel assessing. Uh, we have a, a need to train those in September. We'll then be taking those assessors through the actual assessment process themselves. So they'll be um, certified uh, in October and we're hoping to commence wider assessments in November. We will also open um, the CABE scheme to non-members uh, on probably, um, hopefully at the start of November. Uh, but we need to stagger the pipeline of people coming through um, in order to be able to manage the number of applications we expect to get. Now, it's worth saying that clearly timelines are very constrained. Um, we are moving as quickly as we can to get the scheme up and running at scale. We're doing everything we can to ensure we can process as many members through the assessment scheme by the end of the April um, window for registration um, but it's important that um, we're realistic that, that this is now um, uh, a challenging target what we can say is that we will continue to um, assess people after the April deadline that's not the end of the assessment process it's just the end of the initial registration window um, but we we hope to be able to issue further guidance on um, how uh, members can um, look to manage through this process, um, particularly in terms of considering class one registration um, and in terms of working under supervision um, at the other end of the um, registration period. And we can talk about that a little bit further later. So the K Building Inspector Competence Assessment Scheme or CBICAS, it's a portfolio based assessment scheme. It looks at a broad range of evidence, including a mix of formal qualifications and career exp experience and on the job learning. Assessments are contextualized to reflect the candidate's scope of work. Um, so you need to be very clear in your own mind about the type of work against what you wish to be assessed and certified for. And we've combined this um, process with a range of other assessments to give um, the greatest benefit as possible whilst also streamlining um, the range of assessments that people might want. So existing members can be assessed for certification purposes only through this process. 
if they're at the right grade of membership, they can upgrade their membership and be assessed for building control um, competence uh, at the same time as part of a single process. And non-members can apply for membership and assessment at the same time. Uh, successful candidates at class two, three or four will also then be eligible to register with the Engineering Council as incorporated engineers and use the IENG post nominal. So uh, because we have third party oversight from the Engineering Council, there's an opportunity to um, obtain uh, a, a very significant level of additional professional uh, recognition that goes beyond uh, the building control assessment as well. So, we're, we've we've designed the scheme so that it can fulfill as many functions in one assessment process as possible. We talk about certification, and I think this will become clearer over time, but um, in effect, what, what CABE is able to do through this scheme is issue a certificate which sets out the class of registration and the scope of registration for which members have been assessed. Um, it will still be up to individual members to us apply for registration, indicating what class of registration they're seeking to the BSR, but they can use CAPE um, certification as part of their evidence. Ultimately, the decision to register rests with the BSR, but we do expect that it will be um, only in rare circumstances where um, evidence of process through the scheme is not, not accepted. The draft documents we're hoping to publish um, later this month Will be uh, and these are the four documents you'll need to focus on initially the building inspector competence framework um, so that's our version of the BICOF and it incorporates a lot of information from the BICOF and I'll talk through that in a moment there'll be a complete guide for people looking to register at classes two three and four so that's an overview document and then there'll be two application forms that you'll need to look at uh, the first is what's known as the stage one application form, which is for class two, three, and four registrants. And then flowing from that, there'll be a series of different stage two application forms, depending on which class of registration you're applying for and whether you're an existing or non CAVE member. Um, we are not, I think I need to be clear, planning to launch registration um, processes for class one um until spring next year and as i'll explain in a moment class one trainees uh there's no expectation if you want to register with the building safety regulator that you need to go through an assessment um we do have in our framework class class one categories but those of career development um purposes uh, and membership purposes uh, for cave they're not for registration purposes with the bsr but we won't be launching that till spring next year so that we can prioritize um, class two, three, and four uh, assessment registrants. So the building inspector competence framework, the K building inspector, the K BICOF, as we refer to it, um, is a significant document. Um, don't be overly worried by the number of pages in this document. If you read through, it sets, sets out the background um, for the framework, so expectations uh, for registration for building inspectors, expectations for CAVE membership, because obviously we've combined um, both factors in the competence framework, our membership grades and how they relate to this. Um, detail on the building safety regulators, building inspector competence framework, uh, registration as a building inspector um, in terms of scope of reg registration at each class, uh, guidance on CAVE mem mem grades of membership, um, and then the actual competence framework itself, which is split down into um, a range of grade um, linked to class of registration uh, frameworks. Now, my recommendation when you want to get to grips with this is read, read through the introductory parts and then decide which class you're going to focus on. Focus on the role descriptors for that class and membership grades only look at the class role description, look at the um, competence framework for that class, and look at the supporting annexes, which apply to all of the uh, different classes of registration. Print, print those relevant parts out, but don't, don't print the whole document out. It's 155 um, pages in total. You only really need to refer to about 30 out of the entire document. Um, how does the class structure and um, class of registration and membership uh, interrelate. Um, so this, doc, this diagram 
shows how our engineering council um, oversight relates to the different classes of registration. So we've got EngTech on the left hand side at the top, which relates to uh, an RQF relevant level of three um, and a building inspector class of class one. We then that includes CABE members who are at technician associate or graduate level. And as you work across the columns to the right, it sets out the relevant qualifications, the indicative CABE member uh, RQF level and expectations in terms of um, experience with or without qualifications. For classes two, three, and four, these all relate to IENG registration requirements. Um, and you can see class two, the BSR is required. Um, RQF level is four to six. That's equivalent to a chartered member grade. And then class two or three, two, three, or four um, can also relate to um, MCABE and uh, M Cape C Build E and fellow grades. The minimum level you need to be a class three or four is at M Cape C Build E. Um, and the same um, applies. So that uh, applies to fellows. Um, scope of registration will provide further detail on this, but essentially everyone's going to need to determine the class of registration they want, the type of building by purpose group the height of building and the type of activity they're going to undertake, plan checking and inspection. Um, that'll be uh, inputted into a matrix. That's what you'll be assessed against. So your material for assessment will need to cover this. Um, and that's what your certification and registration will need to cover, although it's up to you what you apply to register for. Um, in terms of further information, uh, each of the classes has got information on the role descriptors that are drawn from the BICOF. We have membership grade descriptors in the BICOF, K BICOF as well. Um, and we also have further information which sets out how the BICOF is structured. Now, everyone who's a CABE member should be familiar with this. So it's split down into five sections, A, B, C, D, and E, covering knowledge and understanding, design development, responsibly, responsibility management and leadership, communication and interpersonal skills and professional commitments and standards. Um, and within each of those sections, we've mapped the core topic uh, subject areas from the BSR's BICOF, um, and those are identified. Um, when you look at the tables, which I'll come on to in a moment, areas that incorporate elements of the BSR's BICOF are highlighted by being dark green boxes, whereas the remainder of the uh, boxes are light green where they contain um, primarily CAVE membership requirements. Um, again, as with the BSR's BICOF, there are level descriptors, but these are numbered, but they are directly analogous. So level one is awareness, level two is appreciation, level three is understanding, and level four is comprehensive. But they are expanded and integrated with the CABE level uh, indicators. Um, and this is where we end up in terms of the competence matrix, which sets out the expectations against each of the um, uh, requirements set out in the BSR's BICOF. So this table is probably the most useful to refer to. The classes of um, registration are set out down the left-hand side. You then got the indicative RQF levels, the minimum CABE grade of, reg reg grade of membership relevant to registration or certification at that level, and then the levels of competence expected against each of the topics. Um, it's also important to understand within the KBICOF that the annexes provided are um, mandatory. You need to review these and be comfortable you can answer questions um, uh, across these core areas of, of professional competence, which um, include guidance on building safety, sustainability, inclusive design, risk, um, ethical principles, whistleblowing, and security. The table structure, um, again, this is just an example. Uh, once it's published, you'll need to be familiar with these, but it's very similar to the most recent CABE competence framework. At the top, you have the category and overarching competence for the section. So section B competence is about applying appropriate theoretical and pr practical methods to inspect, assess, and review building engineering processes systems, et cetera, et cetera. You then have an a statement of intent in plain English underneath that that helps to explain 
um, perhaps in more direct terms, what the section is trying to achieve. You will have an indication of which of the annexes are most relevant to this section. And then you have four columns. The first sets out the, the competence number. The second sets out the competence descriptor. So this is the outcome that you need to demonstrate you can achieve. The second column sets out the scope. So this is these are the kind of broad areas of um, knowledge and understanding, if you like, or scope of activity that you should be able to uh, demonstrate. And the third column demonstrates evidence. Now, I mentioned before, um, the dark green boxes um, are the areas where we've incorporated the core competencies from the BSR BICOF. The light green boxes, arcade membership criteria, um, you'll need to be able to uh, demonstrate that you've met both. So there are three main stages to the assessment. Stage one um, will be an initial application, which is your career portfolio evidence and a synopsis of your technical report. Um, so uh, this includes C, uh, your CV, CPD and training records um, and a synopsis of the stage two technical report. So at stage two, the two main parts of the submission are a technical report covering the scope of registration, the types of work that you do as a building inspector against um, the A and B competencies, which are underpinning knowledge and understanding and how that's applied in practice. I'll talk about that more in a moment. And then a series of competence statements um, against each of the competence requirements. That will be um, desktop reviewed and scored by an assessment panel. Um, and then there will be um, at the third stage, uh, a two part interview, the first part of which will review and focus on the technical report. So those core areas of understanding and how they're applied. And then a second stage after a short break which will look at the professional review criteria more broadly. So focusing more on the competence statements than the technical report. Stage one submission, what does that include? Um, personal information, current employment details, education and formal qualifications, supporter details. So we need some verification from others that they um, your application is sound and your uh, statements are kind of broadly relevant. Um, a copy of your current CV, including recent project history, probably covering the last five years, but it's up to you. But please don't make it um, too much more than three or four pages at most. Um, career development plan. So um, basically, professional, also known as personal development plans, but um, how you'll manage uh, a forward look as to how you're managing your competence. You'll be required to write a personal statement on training experience. This is basically an overview of your career history and how you've developed your competence, knowledge and understanding. CPD records, um, at least of the last two years, but if you need to um, submit three years, that would be fine if, if that's required to demonstrate how, you, how you've maintained your competence. You'll need to state your intended class and scope of registration, so what you want to be certified and assessed against. You'll need to provide a summary of the scope of the projects and case studies you're going to use in your technical report for the stage two submission. Um, and you'll need to um, sign a declaration that the work is your own. Um, and at this stage, I should say, you know, um, it's really important that you do um, make sure the work within the application is your own. Um, we undertake a number of due diligence checks to in ensure that there's not plagiarism or copying or the use of standard answers. Um, uh, and once you sign that declaration, if, if we do find that people have been um, cheating in some form, it could be um, a disciplinary matter. Um, so stage two submission, uh, recap of your personal information just for processing purposes, and then a series of comp personal competence statements. Now the competence statements are there to enable you to reference um, real world examples against the competences that are set out um, to help form a basis for the second stage interview discussion. You will need to work on them um, in some detail and over a period of time um, to draft them so that they're impactful and concise, but there's guidance in um, the documents we'll issue on how to write good competence statements. Work with others to, to improve them. You know, you can talk to others or ask uh, um, other people to review or comment on uh, your statements, but you might, they must be your own statements. They must be your own work. The technical report, 
um, is uh, depending on the scope and level of or class of registration that you want, probably a report between 4,000 and 6,000 words. It is a case study based report that should help you to describe the day to day work you do in a way that meets the competence requirements. So whilst we understand that um, not everyone has a lot of experience of writing um, detailed reports, um, this is very much about putting down in writing your views and experiences and thoughts about how you've delivered build and control services against um, a range of case study projects. Um, and there's guidance in the documentation as to how you identify which projects are most appropriate. Um, the stage three interview, just in more detail, it'll be the two panel assessors who have reviewed and scored the technical report um, at desktop stage. The discussion will last about 60 minutes. It'll focus on the content of the technical report and on, and on evidencing the underpinning knowledge and understanding of building control um, functions and on construction technologies. So if you look at the A and B competencies when the framework is published, those are the competencies that are assessed at that first interview stage. There's a short break in between and then a professional review interview which will last about 50 minutes and can look at any of the A to E competencies. Um, and so that includes looking at management skills, at interpersonal skills and professional commitment um, in line with the kind of broader K framework. Very important to be positive about the interview process. It's there to give everyone an opportunity to demonstrate their broader competence. If you're not so strong at the written submissions, this is an opportunity to um, develop um, a clear evidence base for the panel assessors that, of your capability in terms of doing um, the work covered by any part of registration. And they're going to be trained, as are all CABE assessors, to make sure they give you the very best of opportunity to demonstrate that competence. So they're there to help you um, succeed um, in uh, the assessment process overall. As I said, there's guidance in the document on uh, preparing competence statements and preparing a technical report. We'll get this published as soon as we can. Um, and that kind of brings me to the end of, of today's uh, formal part of the presentation. We'll move on to Q&A um, in a minute. Um, but I think just kind of to recap, the registration process for building inspectors really does emphasize just how important the role of the building inspector is in delivering the right outcomes in the built environment. Um, as I said before, building control may be pioneers in in this space, you know, absolutely at the front edge of uh, competence assessment and competence manage, management, but everyone's going to need to follow suit. Um, and I think um, that this is going to prove to be um, very, very positive for the profession as a whole. I think we're entering into um, a much better environment where people will be able to develop and thrive and also um, much better supported in delivering the outcomes that we know um, CAVE members who work in building control are committed to delivering in terms of the public interest aspects of building control. Um, the CAVE uh, Building Inspector Competence Assessment Scheme, uh, we have scheme approval. We're still working through the process of spinning the actual scheme up and completing our engineering council um, approvals in detail. Uh, we're looking for panel assessors, so if you have the right experience and grade of membership, please do get in touch. Um, and then we'll be undertaking that training and certification of those assessors in due course. We're looking to ramp up the scale of assessment as soon and as quickly as we have, but clearly timelines are challenging. Uh, but critically, we'll, we will get publication um, of the core scheme material out to our members and those who are interested in applying um, as soon as possible so that people can start to work on the material that goes into their applications. So that brings the um, uh, presentation part to an end. I'm going to take a short drink. And then I'm going to start working through um, the uh, some of the Q&A that we have. I haven't had a chance to look at these so far. Um, so. Um, 
start with questions. Okay, so regards to liabilities as personal regulators, is the individual building inspector personally liable or the authority that he or she works for? As I understand it, um, if you act negligently, you may always be exposed, but it, it, essentially the liability of building inspectors under the new uh, regime won't really change compared to the liability that exists at the moment. The primary responsibility rests with the building control body Clearly, if a building inspector breaches either the Building Safety Regulators Code of Conduct or breaches um, the CABE Code of Conduct, they could be held accountable for their own individual actions. But in terms of broader liability, um, my understanding is that individual building inspectors are not, um, uh, not going to be any more accountable than they have been in the past. So the insurance requirements and liability requirements rest with the building control bodies um, primarily. So next question, who would be responsible for, oops, who would be responsible and how will it be determined that the contractors are competent to undertake the works? So um, this goes back to what I refer to as the track back approach. Um, there are two aspects to determining competence. One is where you're working on a higher risk building. The other is when you're working on building work that's not high risk. So for high risk buildings at the gateway stages, the building safety regulator is going to require uh, submission of documentation that sets out the competence requirements and uh, of project teams and construction teams um, and statements as to how those competence requirements are going to be met and managed. Um, for non uh, high risk building work, um, it's very much about an expectation that um, where there are defaults, where there are defects, where there are non-compliances that are identified by building control, the building control starts to challenge back on how the duty holders have determined that their workforce is competent. Now, this is going to be a, an evolving area. We don't have any um, statutory guidance or detailed guidance on this, but um, clearly uh, the onus of responsibility will be on the contractors to be able to evidence how they have done things um not uh, so the, the the onus will not be on the building control body to to interrogate or um work to support the contractor in, in demonstrating these facts the onus will be on the contractors um to be able to demonstrate that they are competent and the same is true of designers and all of the other duty holders and this is why it's so critical that they actually um look to manage their records and their processes and get in line with the expectations because at the point where you're asked to demonstrate your competence, if you haven't got any records, then um, clearly um, that does leave people open to um, more interrogation. But I think we'll learn more about expectations around this as the system develops. Next question, we have a system of which we have site inspectors who are not deemed project managers, so are simply the eyes and ears on site. Will they need to reach level three to inspect or can we remotely supervise? Wow. Um, look, we're expecting some guidance to be published on supervision in due course. It's a really important part of how the system will function. The scope of registration that's required um, as we understand it, will allow people to indicate whether they do inspection work, plan checking work, or both. So there is, um, as we understand it, variability in how registration can be assessed and um, the scope of certification registration that people can have. Um, whether they should be working unsupervised on site, I think depends on what level of registration they have. If if they're class two, they should be capable of independently working on class two scope building works. They're class three, ditto, they should be competent to work on higher risk buildings or complex non-standard buildings independently. Um, if they are not able to reach class two or three, then they'll need to work within a supervision framework of some sort under someone who is registered at that, those levels. And we'll need to see um, how that works in the longer term. Next question, strategic context for regulatory framework defines duty holders under section 3.5 as those that commission and carry out building work. It does not mention designers. Is this a deliberate omission or a mistake? 
Um, no, the all of this will be caught in the duty holding regulations uh, when they are published. There were draft versions of this previously. Um, uh, the Building Act just sets broad terms. The detail of the duty holders will be captured um, uh, almost certainly in the duty holding regs. The previous drafts were very explicit around designers, contractors, principal designers, principal contractors, uh, clients and accountable persons. Um, and we expect that to be replicated um, as and when those uh, duty holding regs are published. Next question. Um, what about private clerks, works, fire engineers and quality inspectors? Do they have to be assessed before inspecting high rise buildings? How will the assessment be conducted? OK, well, the registration framework for building inspectors covers building inspectors. Um, those are the people who undertake restricted activities or functions, as I set out in in the webinar if you're outside of people undertaking those activities or functions then you won't need to be registered and as we understand it neither will specialist cons specialists who are consulted by building inspectors so um structural engineers who are consulted by uh, the building inspector and remember building inspectors are under a duty to seek more expert advice as and when necessary, they would qualify in our view and understanding as expert advisors. In terms of private clerks who work, fire engineers, et cetera, et cetera, who are working for clients, well, they'll need to work within the wider duty holding framework um, in terms of um, how they contribute to that quality management piece. Um, I think it's quite interesting question as to whether there are theoretical loopholes around whether clerks of works and quality inspectors um, fall under the definition of designers. Um, but certainly if they have any impact or make any recommendations in terms of changing the design or the, or the quality of the building work, then they will be captured. But I do, it is an interesting question as to whether they um, fall under um, those categories. What's critical to understand, though, is that clients and anyone in the supply chain, contractors, designers, or others, so whoever appoints someone uh, who's a party to this building work still has an obligation to ensure that they're competent to do their job. So even if they don't fall into a duty holding category, whichever of the duty holders appoints them has got to make sure they're competent. Okay. So next question, Chris, uh, will the CBICAS have its own code of conduct for registered building inspectors? We are aware that the BCF, BSCF scheme has its own code of conduct, despite there being a code of conduct published by the HSE. Uh, simple answer will be um, no, the CABE code of conduct will still be applicable to CABE members. The registered, uh, the, the building safety regulators code of conduct for building inspectors will be applicable in in terms of any proceedings that they initiate as a result of investigations or complaints or matters coming to light. So you're going to end up with uh, two tiers of um, uh, potential complaints or issues around professionalism um, in the same way that architects have um, quite often membership of the RIBA and um, the Architects Registration Board. They have different codes of conduct. There are two potential uh, lines of disciplinary process. But these normally start with the higher tier body. So we would expect that if there were a complaint against the building inspector as an individual, it would be referred to the building safety regulator in the first instance. And then if people wanted, uh, if, if the, there were requests for that complaint to be examined under the CABE code, with code of conduct, subsequent to that investigation by the BSR being undertaken, then we would also do that. They are two different things. One is a registration regime and the other with CABE is a membership regime. So Whilst it's um, uh, not ideal to have separate codes of conduct, we're not going to add a third one into the mix. Um, how can we be expected to give no ice whatsoever? Surely this kills the industry. Okay, so I, I'm guessing this goes to the design advice versus um, advising on compliance question. So this is how we see this. 
Building control bodies are under a duty to advise on what they deem is reasonable in terms of complying with the functional requirements. So if you're in a conversation and there is an issue, as the building control body, you should be specifying the performance requirements or the outcomes, or at most suggesting um, various common ways that um, issues have been addressed. You should not be telling or suggesting that the client adopt any particular approach. They need to come back to you with a proposal to resolve that compliance issue. Now, we know that this has been um, a question that's been around for some time. Um, we, you know, we're without wishing to be at risk of, of um, speaking on behalf of the building safety regulator, it seems clear from um, what we've seen that they perceive that building control has become over relied upon by design teams to solve problems that are the responsibility of the design teams. And I think what we can expect is some further pushback um, from the building safety regulator or guidance um, or further, you know, perhaps as part of their monitoring arrangements, um, uh, stipulations as to how this needs to be done. But it is about a, it is a fine line, and I don't underestimate how difficult it is. But you know, the 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 way we see it is that this is about the difference between indicating performance requirements and expectations in terms of outcomes, rather than actually looking to be a source of solutions for design problems that have occurred. So, um, next question: How will the BSR gauge enforcement? in regards to register building control approvers when it comes to reporting? I, I don't know. I think we'd, there's going to be a process of learning um, how the oversight regime um, is going to work. Um, and we'll just have to come back to that in, in, in longer term. And I think the general view we have is that the BSR will be pragmatic as it goes through its own learning curve. Um, but that communication will be much, much better. There'll be a lot more material published about where things have gone wrong or where expectations haven't been met. Um, next question, has the term complex been defined as yet? Um, we, we're waiting final clarifications on that from the BSR. So um, alongside the scope matrix, as soon as we have clearance to um, share the final version of that we will do and, and I hope that that's going to also address the kind of complex or standard non-standard definition. Um, if if you're currently not a manager, how in the future would you be able to demonstrate level of four, of four abilities to become a manager? So the way we look at development through this pipeline is that everyone's going to need to have the opportunity to work under supervision to develop skills that they can then use to evidence um, their competence for um, an extension of scope or class. So um, again, uh, in the new year, once we're largely through the initial registration process, we'll be looking at publishing guidance on how um, people who are certified through CABE can extend their scope of registration or their, or, or their class of registration. But what's key is that you'll need to get experience working under supervision. This is actually, you know, this is sensible stuff, isn't it? If you are going into undertaking new types of work, then you should have someone who's got that experience um, guiding you, helping you to understand how to do it effectively, um, looking over your shoulder to, at uh, the relative level of um, uh, intensity to make sure that you're not at risk and, and neither are the others you manage. So um, again, it's uh, gonna be a matter of um, waiting to see exactly what further information comes forward. But but this principle of working under supervision and then using that to build evidence for an extension of scope or class registration is, I think, quite fundamental. Um, I'm currently ACABE. Sorry, I've just lost that. There's more questions that come in. Currently ACABE, is there any way to combine the interview and application process for my full chartership with the application for building safety regulator? Yes. So I tried to um, set this out in the presentation, but you can apply for an upgrade of membership and assessment against the BICOF at the same time, because we've combined the building inspector competence framework with our membership grade framework. So you can get both of those and you'll have an option to register as IENG um, if you um, are successful at class two, three or four. So yes, single process to do both. 
if you're already in the pipeline for membership upgrades, um, please talk to the membership team about how we can facilitate combining those. Uh, do you know at present what registration costs will be? Uh, no, um, we will um, communicate those to uh, people as soon as we do. So why is there a focus on CBuild E persons being able to be on panels and attain level three when the majority of members with CBuild E purely have that denomination because they took the assessment for members? Um, so the requirement within the building, the BICOF is, is uh, RQF level six, which is MCABE equivalent. We have basically set our requirements at MCABE CBLD uh, to reflect um, uh, a need to have a, a longer track record and more experience. Uh, it's as, as straightforward as that. Um, will recently accredited CABE members gain an automatic competence certification? Um, no. Um, if you haven't been through a system of assessment that incorporates the Building Inspector Competence Framework, you will have to be re reassessed. The BSR has been absolutely clear about this. Um, everyone will have to go through a test, whether it's an exam or an interview, um, if they're going to be certified um, for registration purposes. So um, I'm sorry if you've just been through one process. Um, if you've got technical reports or other or competent statements, you may find that they're, um, you know, quite relevant to the statements that need to be prepared for this process. So you might find some um, efficiencies there, uh, but um, um, the scheme uh, can't recognise previous um, approvals. Uh, next question. Is there any further information about how supervision of work should be carried out? We're hoping to get further information um, in due course. Is there a cost involved to register through CABE? Uh, yes, it'll be similar to, uh, this is very similar to the process that we use to assess people for membership or for engineering council registration. We work on a cost recovery basis. We're a not-for-profit, we work on cost recovery, um, but there will be a cost um, for um, the assessment process and there'll be a cost for ongoing um, certification. We're required as a scheme provider to oversee ongoing competence of those people that we certify. Um, we're required to make data returns to the building safety regulator. We're required to um, audit CPD and personal development planning. Um, so there's an ongoing cost as well and those will be published as part of the application documentation that we're looking to publish in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so another question, what if not enough, sorry. What if not enough people register to cover the building work requiring building regulations oversight? Is there a contingency plan? Look, um, we are focused on getting as many people as apply for a certification through this system as possible. Um, it is worth remembering that that April deadline is a registration deadline. It's not a, it's not a point at which um, assessment stops. Um, if people are worried about getting through assessment by that April deadline, then we highly recommend that as early as possible prior to the deadline, they register at class one um, and then agree super, uh, sufficient supervisory measures with, with their employers until they can um, go through the assessment. Uh, and get registered at a higher class if that is necessary. Um, the wider issues about capacity in the system are um, a concern. Um, I think our message would be, um, this is a, a process that we need to get through. Um, it's doable. It's about the skills that people largely already have. It's about evidencing those. Um, uh, and then we'll have to look at um, how we can support kind of increased capacity in the longer term, um, which I think the registration and regulation of the profession will actually um, help to improve. But yeah, no, we, we know that there are uh, capacity issues at the moment. And I think the next question kind of covers that as well. Um, will you need to produce a technical report as an overview for each evidential piece you submit in your portfolio of evidence? The technical report is a broad, yeah, there's guidance on the technical report in the documentation that we'll publish. Um, uh, 
And there are ways that you can use that to evidence the kind of broad scope of what you need to do. Um, what is CAVE's intention for overseas CAVE members, continued support, et cetera? Um, well, reg registration against this scheme is only relevant in England at the moment. It may become relevant in Wales at some stage, depending on the decisions of the Welsh government. Um, in terms of overseas, if you are working overseas and need to be registered here, then you would simply go through the same process of assessment as far as uh, I'm concerned. But if you want to contact uh, the membership team with any specific concerns you've got, they'll pass them to me and I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, yeah, so comments about revisiting the guidance. Um, I think people are going to have to invest some time. Uh, we'll do some further webinars and sessions on the detail once it's published to try and talk people through competent statements and technical reports and so on. Um, but yes, you know, there is an investment in time that's needed here. Let's have a look at another question. Last question, I think, for today. If you're an existing member of CAVE and your CPD records are already with CAVE for the last five years, is this still required? Um, yes, I mean, uh, it's straightforward. You need to, we, we'll have to audit what you submit as evidence against this assessment process rather than us deciding what gets selected from that last period of records. But it shouldn't be too difficult, I think, if you've already uploaded and recorded that CPD, either to um, extract it or to um, resubmit it again as part of the application. Um, I'm going to call it to um, the presentation to a close there. Um, there's a huge number of questions um, that I haven't managed to get to. We will review those and publish um, some FAQs. Um, and if necessary, go back to people individually to respond to the questions they have. Um, please do get in touch with um, CABE HQ if you've got further questions. We will publish further information as soon as possible uh, to enable people to get to work. We know that there's a significant appetite for people to get on and get start um, looking at their applications, um, which is great. Um, but we will get that information out to you as soon as possible. Um, and there will be further sessions, um, perhaps, perhaps some kind of wider Q&A sessions um, as that information gets published. Um, with that, I'm going to um, draw this to a close and just say thank you uh, very much for attending and that I hope it's been helpful. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you everyone who has joined this morning. Just to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel soon, which you can be shared with your colleagues. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up and hopefully I'll see you all next month. Thank you very much.